Hey, this is Paul Gilmartin from the Mental Illness Happy Hour, and you are listening to The Soul of Life. And if you happen to turn it off, your life will cease to work. So uh, pay attention. He knows what the fuck he's doing. I'm very skeptical of any view that views the body as disposable. If we can just transcend this meat body and get our brains uploaded into silico so that we can live in silico as creatures of pure thought. Today on The Soul of Life, I speak to award-winning science fiction writer Ken Liu, author of The Paper Menagerie, the only fiction work that won three awards at once, The Nebula, The Hugo, and World Fantasy. Most of our pop cultural myth games, movies, TV shows. These are the things by which we trade stories in the same way they used to trade stories of Achilles and Hector. Our heroes, Spider-Man, Batman, whatnot, these are all owned. Luke Skywalker, these are all owned by corporations. Lou actually penned a novel in the Star Wars series for Disney Press, and I have the privilege to peek inside his incredibly thoughtful and creative mind on themes that show up in his writing and in my world of clinical psychology, like the problems with valuing rational thought more than emotional development, natural multiplicity of the mind, and technology as a means of storytelling. There is no such thing as some sort of a value-free rational analysis that just doesn't exist. But we like to pretend that somehow we can do such a thing, and I, I think that's deeply flawed. Most of the destructive ideologies of the 20th and now the 21st century were rationalist ideologies. Ken's award-winning fantasy series, The Dandelion Dynasty, part of which is being adapted for an AMC TV show, depicts engineers playing the role of wizards in an industrial era East Asian setting and style of fiction he calls silk punk. Bamboo, silk, animal, sinew, and then it's usually based on muscle power or wind power or water power uh, kites. Silk Punk is a riff off the popular science fiction genre, Steampunk. Set in the 1800s early industrial era of steam engines, Steampunk authors imagine steam technology taken to extremes of application that never actually occurred. You would just have all sorts of machines and inventions based on steam era technology. It's deeply attractive. Liu is trained as an attorney and worked as a software engineer and has translated many Chinese fiction authors' works, most notably The Three-Body Problem, recently acquired by Netflix with other books for what is thought to be close to $1 billion. Ken says his fiction often projects East Asian history and culture onto the backdrop of the modern American empire and says our traditional association with Roman history in the U.S. is an artificial rigidity he hopes to bend. We just have a refusal to accept that the story of America includes Asian voices. Finally, Ken speaks about one of my favorite subjects, how our minds and our sense of self or soul is actually a continuous construction process. The person who wrote those stories was a very different person. That author is a stranger to me. I can't possibly write those stories now. I asked Ken to do a little experiment with me and reflect on his own mind's construction process, listening to me read back to him some of his own writing. We are deeply embedded in each other in a way that we don't fully acknowledge. And finally, I wonder if Ken is willing to extend his faith in our connection to one another and the universe to outer space aliens, since I've been really freaked out by the Pentagon's recent disclosure of frequent encounters they have with objects they can't identify. We're just bit players in everybody else's story. That's always how it's going to be. How many more trillions and quadrillions of stories like that are there in the universe? Welcome to episode 18, the final episode in season three, Ken Liu. You can view the Star Wars universe or the Marvel Cinematic Universe as the modern version of our cathedral, done by many people over many generations. And it's beautiful. It's, it's our collective storytelling done within a corporate context. I'm Keith Miller, and my podcast, The Soul of Life, is here to help you remember who you really are. I'll bring together people who have gotten off their treadmills. I'll have conversations with athletes, musicians, doctors, scientists, healers, and entrepreneurs to discuss the fascinating edges of our knowledge in neurobiology, psychology, and physics. This 
is the soul of life. Have you ever been in a position where you know that you or your family member really needs emotional support or marriage enrichment, but you find out how expensive it is to get access to high quality out of network professionals? Well, I've created the Soul of Life community just for this. At community.souloflifeshow.com, you can join for free and be part of a network of caring and supportive people having conversations that can bring healing to your soul. It's there that you'll find access to psychoeducational courses to deal with stress, anxiety, and relationship conflict. For example, right now I'm offering a seven-week immersive course for couples called Mindful Marriage that walks people through a mindfulness-based stress reduction curriculum I designed that really gives couples in conflict a map towards stability, trust, and deeper intimacy. Just go to community.souloflifeshow.com, check out the courses, and join for free to be part of the Soul of Life community of learners and soul seekers. Thank you so much, Keith, for having me. This is a real pleasure. In my field of psychology, we're often in emotional development, right? And and how the mind works. I know I, I spoke to you uh, initially about sort of my fascination with your um, depiction of these aliens in one of your short stories, The Taunin, um, which by the way, that particular book, the short stories, uh, Invisible Girl short stories is narrated by an incredible voice actor. Great, really well done. Um, and how the Taunin has this, you know, ability to deal with their consciousness and these these different selves and, and remake and redeem them and over and over and over again. And in fact, in psychology, that's something I've spent my career um, fascinated with, how, how in fact we, you know, as spiritual beings have this ability to do that. Not all of us tap into that quote unquote negative space. It's interesting to hear you talk about that. Yeah, I, I think a lot about um, this question of who we are and, and what the self actually is. Um, you know, this is one of the oldest philosophical questions and it's, it's very, it's very hard to actually work it out. Um, the way we think about ourselves, you know, if you, if you delve into it a little bit, it's quite strange, actually, the way we think about who we are. Um, you know, those of us who are parents know this, um, you watch your kids grow up and they're, different people really from day to day uh you're always saying hello to one person in the morning and then saying goodbye to that person at night because they change you know the three-year-old you know is not the five-year-old that you know and who's not the 10-year-old you know and who's not going to be the woman that she will become um and that happens to us too it's just that you know we inhabit our consciousness ourselves, and we don't really see that. It's a very similar problem to the ship of Theseus. Um, it's the idea that you change a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. At some point, you're no longer the same person, but at what point does that happen or does it ever happen? Or, you know, there are many philosophical resolutions to that conundrum, but um, I don't think there's ever been a very satisfactory answer to it. And I think a lot about what does it mean to have a self? I mean, you know, the reality is if you go through 10 to 15 years, I believe um, every cell in your body is, has changed and every atom of your body has been replaced. Um, you really are a different quote unquote ship. Uh, and yet you still think that you are the same person somehow, at least many of us do. Um, and I just don't know really how to reconcile that. Uh, the story you're talking about, the reborn is a way to struggle with this issue um, among many other things that I, I struggle with. Uh, oftentimes my short fiction is a way for me to work out some emotional or philosophical issue that I struggle with that I don't quite know how to resolve. Um, and and this is this is one of the things that I, I struggle with a lot. Um, when I put together my debut collection, the Paper Menagerie and Other Stories, you know, as I mentioned, I, I've been writing um, and publishing really for some 20 years. Um, so when I was putting together that collection, I had a lot of stories to pick through. And the reality is a lot of the stories are not stories that I could write now. Uh, I, I'm a different writer and, and the person who wrote those stories is, was a very different person. And that author is a stranger to me. 
Uh, and I, I could not possibly, um, uh, I, I can't possibly write those stories now. Um, and I think about how is it that I still think of myself as the same person? How is it that we just assume without any trouble that it's the same person who wrote those stories? So, you know, I, I think mm -hmm. about that a lot and we just don't, we don't really question that. We don't think about what it means to change. What does it mean to, and, and what happens to responsibility? What, what happens to, to guilt, to duty, right. to rights? Right. These are all very complicated questions when you start thinking about this illusion of a unitary self. So that's a great word for it, Ken. That's, um, I, you know, it's not quite a sea change yet in our field in psychology, but it is, is really looking to be, it's the turning, a turning point over the last five to 10 years of the, in the neuropsychology of neuroplasticity. And this idea is really coming to the forefront that we are not the same person, that there's no way that we can be monolithic. That's really the old model, but that we have these very distinct parts and that, and yet there are, is some unifying, um, core. Um, energetically or, you know, physiologically, of course. And, and, and your writing really seems to play with, of course, that and, and time and how we render ourselves, how we are perceived, how time shifts. This is the nature of time. You mentioned you're not the same author you used to be. There was an NPR critic or a review of, um, Invisible Girl. And I think the author, the critic said that, you know, this writer, you know, paradoxically is writing about a lot of technology. Some of it seems cold, but, the technology is cold and, and paradoxically, you know, he was criticizing you as in that writing is cold, but I, I wonder, I, I don't get that sense at all. And anyone who's read paper menagerie would, I think, realize that I wonder if grace of Kings has also settled that score for those critics out there that Ken Liu is not somehow a warm personal narrative writer. I think that's actually a really interesting question you're posing, which is what do we perceive as warm and what do mm -hmm. we perceive as cold? And this has to do with, one of my um, uh, abiding uh, obsessions, which is what is the meaning of rationality, right? So this is a very common trope in modern contemporary uh, fiction in general, but especially in sci-fi, the, the idea of rationality. So the way it plays out for most listeners, I, I suspect uh, they, they're very familiar with the idea. Even if you're not a sci-fi fan, you're probably familiar with the trope of Kirk versus Spock. It's the idea that do you do things based on emotional commitments or do you do things based on something called rationality? Um, we in contemporary societies, especially by which I mean uh, no societies that are in some ways committed to the tradition of Western enlightenment um, rationalism, we tend to have um, a preference for so-called rationality uh, as a way of resolving doubt, of, of solving problems. We think that being rational is a positive trait, that this is, this is something good uh, in contrast to emotional, you know, which is view as, viewed as uh, somehow... Um, not as good, uh, prone to error. Um, what I, what a lot of my work tries to do is to call into doubt this distinction. And, and, and because, you know, when it, when it comes down to it, when you actually view what rationality actually means, it turns out most of what we call rationality is just providing post hoc rationalizations for what are deep fundamental emotional commitments. The reason for that is very simple. Rationality just means you're weighing um, costs and benefits. You're, you're, you're supposedly weighing, um, you know, um, balancing factors, you know, the way that the Supreme Court sometimes talks about this rational analysis, rational basis analysis. Um, but when you're weighing these factors, you, you cannot assign a weight to these factors without emotional commitments in the first place. The things that you care about, the things that you think are worth preserving, whether it's freedom or um, uh, uh, collective welfare, whether it's, it's patriotism, whether it's freedom of contract, whatever it is that the abstract value you're trying to weigh, the weight of that particular thing is determined by your emotional commitment to it. That's, that's really all there is to it. Um, so there is no such thing as some sort of a value free rational analysis that just doesn't exist. But we like to pretend that somehow we can do such a thing. And I, I think that's deeply flawed. Um, in fact, most of the 
destructive ideologies of the 20th and now the 21st century were rationalist ideologies who disguised their emotional commitments that are deeply flawed in a way that made themselves seem as if they were completely free from questioning. Um, so I, I guess my point is, a lot of my work deals with the idea that we need to actually reject this obsession with value neutral rationality and, and to reject the idea that there is such a thing or that somehow rationality needs to be prized. Hmm. Wow. I mean, that just endears me even more to you in your writing, Ken, I think, to, to realize your understanding of the, the, the vastness of how emotion motivates us at all levels, that we're deeply emotional creatures. Uh, despite the way we pretend not to be sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's very strange how we, we are, you know, fundamentally, uh, the way we find anything worth doing or worth fighting for is through emotions. And yet we act as though somehow that's a bad thing. Uh, it's right. very, you know, strange. Yeah, it only helps us to get to know all the, all the varying uh, voices inside um, <laughs> uh, and work with them as opposed to letting them go kind of underground and, and yep like you said, do these destructive things and, and act, act out of, uh, out of context of the whole. Um, you, you invented a genre of fiction, I suppose we could call it called silk punk, a variation of steampunk. Um, have we been missing out on Eastern foundational narratives in the U S is that, is that changing through maybe people like you and others? Please take the time now to subscribe to the soul of life, wherever you're listening, give it a thumbs up or write a positive review. Uh, so first of all, let me explain what silk punk actually is. Um, silk punk is not a genre per se. Um, I'm the only person who does it. Uh, I mean, you know, it's a term invented by me to mm. describe my own fiction. If other people want to use it, that's fine, but that's not what I mean by it. <laughs> it's yours. Uh, silk punk really is just a term <laughs> I invented to describe my own fiction. Um, and it is, uh, it's not quite a variation of steampunk as it is an analogous development of steampunk. So what I mean is this. Um, Steampunk is actually a very complicated uh, aesthetic to, to, to sort of fully uh, describe. But most of us understand steampunk at a very intuitive level as it's a form of fantasy slash sci-fi writing wherein we take the technology vocabulary of Victorian era um, England, essentially, and we expand it out and say, what if that technology vocabulary could be taken to its extreme. And, and you would just have all sorts of machines and inventions based on steam era technology that really weren't developed. Uh, but, but what if we could have a world in which that is the case? What kind of stories could you tell? Um, and it's deeply attractive because I think uh, there's something about modern technology that we find to be deeply alien and hard to understand. Uh, a lot of us can open up a computer or a, you know, a, a, a phone. If we open it up, we wouldn't know what to do with it because it's so, the, the, the components are so small and their operations so specialized that most of us have no idea how the technology we rely on actually works. I mean, you try to um, give someone a broken iPhone and say, can you tell me what's wrong with it? Most people have no idea what to do. There's, there's just absolutely nothing. You can't figure it out. Uh, in fact, most of us have trouble even getting our computers to behave uh, right. after an update. Um, but there's something about steam era technology that's very different. You go to a museum and you look at these old steam engines and, and old mm -hmm. mechanical contraptions, and you can see how the components yeah. fit together. You can visually get an understanding of how it works. It's intuitive. Um, I think that's part of the appeal of, of steampunk. Um, so silk punk is quite different in the, in the sense that uh, it's not based on Victorian era England technology. Rather, the technology vocabulary is based on uh, classical East Asian engineering, um, by which I mean something like um, during the entire pre-modern era, essentially. Um, and so this is a technology vocabulary that makes heavy use of materials that are very important to traditional East Asian um, construction. So bamboo, um, silk, uh, animal, sinew. Um, and then it's usually based on 
muscle power or wind power or water power, uh, kites, uh, things of that nature. So the idea is you take these very, very old technologies and you try to imagine what could happen if you try to construct modernity with it. What if you, instead of going down the route of industrialization, relying on steam, what if you went down the route of just developing that technology vocabulary to its utmost end? Uh, and of course, you take some shortcuts using magic. Magic, yeah. Right. Uh, but you just expand it out and, and see see what you can sort of end up with. So that's what I call so punk. It's a, it's an extension of the technology vocabulary of classical East Asian antiquity um, into a new modernity. My novels, uh, the Dungeon Dynasty, really is about it's 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 about two things really. If if I were to summarize it, one is this idea of technology as a language. It's the idea that. Technology isn't actually machines or, uh, you know, it's not computers and rockets and machines. It's, it's actually just a language. A technology is a language through which um, a people um, extend their minds into space. That's what I call technology. And uh, my novels are one of the primary concerns, as, as your description talked about. Um, it's the idea of how does how do, how do human beings in general extend our minds into space and make it tangible, make it visible? That's technology. And the soap punk novels are primarily about one part of it anyway. Um, uh, they're about technology. The second theme that is super important goes back to the thing that I was talking about earlier. It's the idea of storytelling um, and, and, and what modernity really means. Um, my theory um, is that uh, what defines a people is not blood, it's not language, it's not land, it's not any of those things. In fact, what defines a people fundamentally is a collective story. Um, that story is their true constitution. So we as Americans often worship our constitution, the, the, the piece of paper uh, is somehow magical, the same way that, you know, um, previous peoples might have worshipped their gods um, or their ancient founding artifacts. We worship the constitution as a piece of paper. Um, but this is really deeply flawed. The, 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 the paper constitution is actually not the thing that really matters. Um, I, I think most of us have seen that, um, you know, I was trained as a lawyer, so I studied constitutions actually quite a bit um, during law school. And one of the things, you know, I found out was that our constitution is actually not that great, strictly speaking, as a piece of paper. There are many other modern, quote unquote, modern constitutions that are much better drafted, uh, that are much more ideologically um, sound in terms of their commitments to our Western ideals and, and in terms of their um, defenses of both positive and negative rights. However, many of these modern constitutions don't function in practice nearly as well as ours, despite its lacunae and, 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 and weird, vague phrasings and all the rest of it. Um, and the reason is, uh, you know, my, my, my theory is that the paper constitution is really nothing more than uh, the visible piece. You know, it's like the iceberg. You see a little piece sticking out the top, but the vast majority is underwater. The visible document itself is nothing more than the, the, than the little peace poking out of the ocean. The real constitution is the story underneath that unites Americans as a people. When the narrative that Americans share as a people function, the fact that the paper, the document is imperfect is not a big deal. We can always figure out how to do it. Because if you think about it, so much of our political norms and our traditions and the way we figure out compromises and, and manage to get things done was because of this living constitution underneath the paper constitution. The Bill of Rights is worthless without all the norms and all the assumptions underneath um, about what it means to be an American, what does it mean to be free. Um, so it's the story that matters. It's a foundational story that matters to a people. And when that story no longer is a story that most people can commit to, or most people start to have disagreements and doubts about what the story actually means and, and whether all the people who claim to be members of that people get an equal voice in that story. That's when problems start. And I think, you know, our political troubles now 
is precisely because we have to, we're having a fight over what is the American story. Right. Usually we criticize each other for changing. We say, well, you, you, you said this and now you say this. When in fact, that's, that's really natural part of evolution. Like you said about your kids. If you're a parent, you understand that. And when you're working through something, you, you start with this, you're way on this side of the polarity and then you get to know that and then you, you get tired of it and then you flip to the other side and you get to know that and you get tired of it. And maybe you come back in the middle and that next generation sounds like you're saying we have to be more tolerant of our struggles. Yes, I think we have to actually accept these struggles as, as the only way to figure out how the story can be strengthened and made uh, relevant for the next yeah. generation. That's the only yeah. way for it to work. So, yeah. so go back to my earlier point, which is, you know, I, I view all of this as, as Why do deeply. Why you think there's such an, a, the, an aversion? The, the, the foundational the constitution of, of the people, of people is to, a living you know, story divide. that has to change. And be, Obviously, the, I mean, the space and time and my is, is really big. At one, once upon so a time, the, the oceans thing. were first far, theme I mean, was still far apart. Technology, technology vocabulary, technology mm-hmm. is a language. And the second part of it is the idea of how, how does a disparate collection of individual peoples and collectives and individuals really come together and say, we are one people. Um, you know, in some ways, this is the story of the founding of America. This is the story of how does America come to be? Um, one of the weird or interesting ways that the, that people have read this book is that they are very interested in the Asian technology side of it and the drawing on, on, on Asian history. Um, and they don't really understand this is actually a story about America or that this is a story about the founding of modernity in, in the, in the, in the American sense. I think that has to do with the fact that here in the U.S., we often exclude, um, matters of Asian origin as American. We just have a, a, have a refusal to accept that um, the story of America includes Asian voices. Um, you know, we have no trouble with a fantasy novel that uses the analogy of Rome to tell the story of America. Many fantasy Roman epics are really American stories. It's just that instead of, you know, talking about the Roman emperor, they're really being mapped to the imperial American empire. That's what it is. You, uh, speaking about melding, um, you, you, one of your themes that you speak about, about, well, write about is the singularity, this idea that one day yeah. technology will develop so rapidly that it will replace our human development, maybe replace our own genome, and we become more and more one with the machines we create. It was uh, There was a popular movie in 2014 called The Transcendence or Transcendence with Johnny Depp, uh, Morgan Freeman, Paul Bettany, um, that portrays this Dr. Will Caster as a, a person that finally did it. He digitized himself and you, you write about that. You wrote a really brilliant short story in the fantasy magazine, Clark's World. I'm not sure if that, that story was actually printed in, in, in one of your books. Um, but you seem to have, in, at least in that story, the family, there, there's a, it, it, I'm not going to give it away, but it, it seems like you, you know, there's this great fear about what will happen. Of course, people are leaving, they're, they're dying at an alarming rate because they give up the, these bodies to become digitized. Um, and yet, uh, well, I'll just ask you, do you, do you think that that's, that's a hopeful thing or is it, is it left to be this dystopian <laughs> <laughs> ominous? <laughs> so, uh, so this is something that I, I think is deeply interesting. Um, I, I, you know, as an author, one of the great pleasures and also one of the things that can drive you nuts, really depending on your personality, is the way that the story you tell is not necessarily the story that readers read. And readers will take your story in directions that you don't intend or anticipate. That's just the way it is. Um, you know, I was trained as a lawyer, and so I, I pay a lot of attention to the way different rhetorical modes um, affect each other or how they're, how they're actually very different from each other. Um, when you're writing as a lawyer, you're, the analogy is you're trying to construct a very narrow bridge across a chasm for the reader. Um, your goal is to make the bridge really as narrow as possible, to make the reader feel that there's nowhere to go except where you want them to go. Uh, I mean, that's the dream of every lawyer, to to basically massage and lead the judge or the jury down exactly the path they want and, and get them to where they Almost want them to be. Almost a hypnotic sort of um, come along with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. 
<laughs> that's the goal of, of lawyers and, and, and legal rhetoric. Um, in practice, of course, it doesn't work, but you know, you, you always strive for that ideal. But when you're writing fiction, if you write in that manner, if you try to construct a very narrow bridge for the reader to go down, readers will not follow you. They will just leave. They will just say, this is not what I'm here for. Um, that's, that's something that, that authors know intuitively, but it, it's worth sort of talking about it in general. Um, because oftentimes there's a tendency in modernity to write and read nonfiction as though it were fiction. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit because that's a thing that I, I think is very interesting. And so we sort of start to blur the lines between these rhetorical modes. But there really is a huge distinction. When you're writing persuasively, you're doing something entirely different from fiction. So in fiction, what you're really doing is you're constructing a house. Um, and houses don't come alive and don't have meaning until readers move in. And when readers move in, they have to actually unpack their baggage, quote unquote, and, and put their frameworks in. They need to repaint the walls. They need to hang up their own pictures. They need to unpack their clothes and fill the closets. Only then can they start to find meaning in the house because they put their own lives into it. And this is very important because when I write a story, and it's a story about love, what's really behind that story are all the ways I loved and I was loved. Um, you know, when I speak about the word love, I think deeply and often about my grandmother because she was the most important person to me uh, as a young child. And, and so the way I make sense of the world of what it means to love and be loved is inextricably um, linked to all the ways that um, she taught me through her example of, of what that means. So when I write a story about love, those stories that my grandmother lived with me and the example she set for me are going to be there. They're going to be behind the meaning of these abstract words. But when a reader reads one of my stories, she's going to have to fill it with her own stories about love, how she loved and how she was loved, how she deserved to be loved and how she wasn't loved, and so on and so forth. And there are different stories from mine. So when, when she unpacks her stuff into the house and finally feels at home, She's going to have to construct her own story out of that house. So the text I write is merely half of the story. The other half is the reader's unwritten text as, as she mm. you know, interprets mm. it. So the story I write is never the story that readers read. I wonder if, if we can try something, Ken, uh, just to speak about this in real time. Like you're saying, you know, we're really creating things in real time in the moment and so I wonder if I, if I can just read a short segment of your writing and, I, and I'm going to ask you what you see and what you feel and what, you know, can you build the house, you know, your, and share with us as like, well, sure. what are you experiencing of, of hearing your own words, right? And obviously listeners can do that too. Um, you, you write, you know, there's a character in this short story um, about the, the, the singularity and this character um, ends up taking a, a positive view of it. And they say, it's a, she says, humanity is not a cancer of the planet. We simply needed to transcend the demands of our inefficient bodies, machines no longer adequate for their task. How many consciousnesses will now live in this new world? Pure creatures of electric spirit and weightless thought? There's no limits. So what comes up for you when you hear that? What do you feel? So, you know, this is, this is where I say that, you know, um, the this passage is a riff of of one of the oldest um, um, intellectual currents in the history of Silicon Valley, um, but also just generally in the technology field. We've always had these prophets in the technology field who have described human beings as just a variety of of machinery um, that we are in fact primarily uh, minds, mm. not bodies, that our minds are imprisoned mm. inside our bodies. And the reason we die and we get sick, the, we, the reason we grow old, um, the reason we make mistakes, these are all just because our hardware is very faulty. Um, we are really computers. We, we, we need to find better hardware. And if we can just transcend this meat body and get our brains uploaded into in silico, so that we can live in silico as, as uh, creatures of pure thought, 
um, everything would be solved. We would be one with the machine. We would be, we would be awesome. This is, you know, just a very modern variation of very old um, mind versus body Cartesian binary thinking. Um, the reality is, of course, um, at least based on what we know now, which is always subject to change, but based on what we know now, our cognition is very deeply tied to our status as as animals, as living creatures. Uh, we don't just think with our uh, brains. You know, it's not like you can somehow uh, just take the brain and put it in a jar and you would have a human being. It's actually not quite like that at all. Um, the way we, we think is deeply embedded in our bodies in a way that we could not have understood um, even 10 years ago. 10 years ago. Um, uh, and uh, so, for example, one of the biggest um, changes that, that I've seen in the field, just in the time that I've been a science fiction writer is the growing recognition that our consciousness actually may in some ways be not just limited to our own selves, but to other creatures who live in us. Uh, we have this entire ecosystem of microorganisms living inside our bodies, in our gut, gut flora. Uh, it turns out that our gut flora has incredible influence on us, not just in terms of health, but in terms of our mental... Um, Brain chemicals are produced in the gut. Yes, crazy. our emotions, our... Yeah, it's crazy to think that part of our minds is generated by these little creatures, colonies of creatures that live inside us who are not normally thought of as, as us. You know, some some um, uh, scientists now speak of the gut flora as, as another organ of the human body made up of cells that don't share any DNA with yeah. the rest of our yeah. cells. Uh, and I think that's deeply provocative. It goes back to that whole idea of unitary self. You know, where does the boundary between the individual and the collective and the world at large line? Where, where, where is the line between self and not self? If you start to think of these creatures as part of you, it's kind of mind-blowing. Mind blowing. I, I had a guest on recently um, that will come out before your conversation will um, Neil Shupin, author of your inner fish talking about the way the, the face and the brain is, uh, you know, the gill structure in sharks is responsible for how we are talking and listening to each other. And so we have these, mm -hmm. like you said, these beings, so we are, we are uh, millions of millions of creatures. I want to get to kind of, ending to talk about Dune, but also before we do that, I want to ask you about, you know, I've had this, uh, you know, last, last summer I had guys in my backyard over every, every other weekend we watched some alien movie. Um, you know, just because <laughs> it was you know, trying to get people together during COVID in safe ways. And that's what we did. It was fun. But since the Pentagon released all these, you know, the so-called Tic Tac videos of the Navy pilots and, you know, we find so out fun. about these <laughs> Other countries who have been long recording and studying this phenomenon of some visual unidentified aerial phenomenon. I have not been able to really read those stories anymore, Ken. I don't, I don't know about you. How do you, <laughs> I mean, I'm deeply troubled by it. I have to say, like, on the one hand, I'm, I'm fascinated by it and, and sort of would love it, like, to kind of see what would happen when we make contact, right, with other, other creatures outside our, our universe. Uh, how do you feel about this? What's going on in the, in the, with these news stories of UAPs? Um, you know, I, I, like you, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated by them. Um, and, and I don't really know what to think in some sense because we both as individuals and as nations and as, you know, species, we, we can all afford to be a little more humble and reevaluate our place in the universe. Here's the thing. Um, once we recognize that we are the heroes of our own epic fantasies, but only we get to experience that epic fantasy as a whole, we're just bit players in everybody else's story. That's always how it's going to be. It makes us aware of the fact that there are billions of other epic fantasies all around there. We, so much of modernity is about reducing other people to bit players in the story we want to weave around us. Um, the way we criticize people, the way we judge people, the way we think we know their stories just because of one interaction. We are so arrogant as to think that 
because we are the heroes of our own epic fantasies, somehow that's the only story that matters. But there are billions of other stories, each of them equally as moving and important as ours. And to think that, you know, just on this planet alone, there are billions of stories like that. How many more trillions and quadrillions of stories like that are there in the universe? And 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 to me, it's 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 joyful to think that the world is so full of stories and so of so full of adventure and grand epics and and gods and heroes. I'm going to call you um, when I'm freaking out. Really, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. So I I love it. I, I hear these things and I, I feel like maybe that will get us to be a little bit less self centered. Um, so. Dune comes out in the U.S. theaters, or at least the latest attempt at uh, Dune in, in on film comes out October twenty second in the U in the U.S. Have you had a chance to screen it or see it? No, no, but I'm super, super uh, excited about it. Dune is one of my favorite books. In fact, when I wrote the Dungeon Dynasty, uh, a lot of people said that it gave them the feel of Dune, which I took as a huge compliment because you know it's just. Dune is such a wonderful, amazing story. Um, I've I've heard that the movie is excellent, um, a better adaptation than than any other attempts. So, uh, my wife and I are both super excited. Yeah, to see it looks it. it looks fascinating. People are writing reviews. One person I was reading a review said, "This is a Star Wars killer. Like this is like you know, I mean, we hold Star Wars to be this sort of sacred text, you know, and and sacred body in our culture." Um, my generation at least and and it's continued but uh, maybe there's you know and there's of course been many attempts at this uh to try to find some ultimate yes. sort of like what is the narrative star wars and you had you know some time writing about star wars in one of your books um do you feel like it, it could be if, that dune has that capacity to possibly replace in the in the american mythology and film the star wars kind of western mm. You know, this is one of the most amazing things about modernity, right? We, um, in the in the times of the Romans or Greeks or other peoples of the past, their collective stories are really collective stories, meaning they are mythologies that everyone could tap into and rewrite. You know, uh, if you're a poet, you can take these mythologies and, and, and do with them as you will. Our modern uh, society is a little bit unusual in that many of our collective mythologies are corporate mythologies, mm-hmm. meaning they actually have yeah. owners. Um, Star Wars is owned by somebody. You cannot literally do with it as you will. Um, I mean, sure, a lot of us engage in cosplay and fanfic and so on and so forth, but we do so at the mercy of the copyright owner. Technically, you know, as a lawyer, I can tell you that the copyright owner does, in fact, have the right to to squash all of that if they wish to. The only reason they don't is because it's profitable for them to leave it as it is. Um, but there's something very weird about engaging in, um, in, in collective myth-making on someone else's turf. In some sense, all of us are feudal serfs. We work on someone else's land. We, we land that we don't own. Um, and it does change the way we think about it. Um, and I'm not saying this to say that we're living in a dystopia. Often my statements are taken as somehow this is dystopian. It's it's not. I'm not saying, I'm just saying this is the way it is. We have to sort of think about it. I'm not saying people who lived in feudal times as serfs are living a dystopia necessarily. <laughs> you just have to figure out what is the way that you find joy in the, in the state that you actually find yourself in. Um, but the reality is most of our pop cultural myth, games, movies, TV shows, whatnot. These are the things by which we form a collective vocabulary, by which we trade stories in the same way they used to trade stories of Achilles and Hector. Uh, our heroes, Spider-Man, Batman, whatnot, these are all owned. I mean, Luke Skywalker, these are all owned, actually, by corporations. So we have to come to terms with that. Um, I think one of the reasons why Star Wars has been so successful is both Lucas and then Disney later on have really actively tapped into the idea that in order for myth to have lasting power, they need to have collective participation. So both Disney and Lucas before Disney were very careful in terms of inviting the public in to join into the effort of collective myth-making. And I actually was invited to write a Star Wars novel. And I could see that you know throughout the entire process is about cultivating this property of inviting people onto the land and trying to build up the mythology. And precisely because 
many other creators have come in and added to this property now owned by Disney that you can have this magnificent modern cathedral, if you will. You know, you can view the Star Wars universe or the Marvel Cinematic Universe as the modern version of our cathedral. It's 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 a it's a virtual cathedral. It's it's done by many people over many generations. Um, and, and it's beautiful. It's, it's our collective storytelling, uh, done within a corporate context. Dune, on the other hand, um, has not had nearly as successful a history of collective storytelling, collective myth making. I mean, there have been some. I don't mean to suggest that somehow that hasn't happened, but not to the same extent, not to the same degree. So I think in terms of how things will evolve in the future, it's, it's largely a matter of, of, how those who own the rights to Doom will develop and build up um, on this property. And I think um, if it can be built up uh, over time by having, uh, by becoming a, a nexus of collective storytelling, that's how it becomes, takes up the status of iconic. In, any news of, of some of your work being released into film? And, and you have uh, the Veiled Throne being released soon? Is that right? Oh, right. So uh, my epic fantasy, The Dungeon Dynasty, uh, which is actually four books, the third book and the fourth book, um, The Veiled Throne and then Speaking Bones will be released um, later this year and then early next year. The Veiled Throne, the third book, comes out in November and um, Speaking Bones, the last book, comes out next year in May, I believe. Um, the two books are actually written as one. They were just broken in halves because mm -hmm. it was too long. They, my publisher literally said that there's no way to publish that book as one book because it's just too thick. And I, I can understand why it, 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 it is too thick. So they're breaking into two. So I'm super excited about that. Um, AMC is making a, a TV show um, uh, based on my um, stories in The Hidden Girl and other stories. It's the Singularity stories. Um, Craig Silverstein is the showrunner, and I'm very excited to to see the result. Um, I got to do a little bit of work uh, with him on it, uh, and and I think it's going to be really spectacular. So that should come out either later this year or maybe early next year. Uh, I don't know the exact date yet. Very cool. Well, it's such a privilege and pleasure to speak with you today, Ken Liu. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Keith. It's a real pleasure. Hey, I've started a community for Soul of Life fans interested in talking about episodes or getting more information about some of my teaching on IFS, mindfulness, and relationship growth. Head on over to community.souloflifeshow to get access to this group of really cool people just like you who care about the show and want to talk about episodes or, or hear more, or get access to courses and, and support each other through life. That's what this is all about. Please leave an iTunes rating for the show and subscribe now wherever you listen to get more soul in your life. I like it and it's not harsh to my eardrop. All right, I will go.